Warning, the following podcast contains adult language and childish comedy. Listener discretion is advised. And now, please adjust your headphone volume to an unreasonable level and enjoy the most dynamic and electrifyingly entertaining podcast ever to conquer cyberspace. This is Amish Baby Machine. Hello, friends, and welcome to the most powerful podcast ever created, the Amish Baby Machine Pop Culture Podcast starring me, Dags. Today, we have a powerful show. Across this powerful oaken desk is my co-host, Mike Rez. A licky boom boom down, Dags. How you doing? 12 inches of snow. What's up? Oh, not much. Freaking hot the last week. Finally hit a cool down. It's only 79. Some like it hot in the great state of Minnesota. 79 degrees. 79. No humidity. Barometric pressure's holding at 30. Wow. Aren't you the meteorologist? I try to be. It used to be weathermen. I prefer when it was weathermen. Oh, yeah. What about the weather girls? It's raining men. Hallelujah. Powerfully written by uh, Paul Schaefer. Paul Very Schaefer. good. Very good. Then he the, uh, the piano guy? He is. He's a giant pianist. Great show today. We're excited. We got um, beer review, song of the day, and most importantly, a mystery, a great Russian mystery where nine people perished. Yeah, it's uh, quite the mystery. Happened over 50 years ago. And it just got brought back into the news. Uh, 2019, they're going to reopen the case. Right. We'll get into it. And then we'll, I'm going I'm to ask a very important question near the end of the Excellent. Let's get right into it. Powerful show today. Oh, we have a new song. To, we're, we're playing a song at the end of the show, too. Uh, Denotives, Streets of Passion, is coming up at the end of the show. So stick around for that. You're going to love it. That is Synthwave? Synthwave at its finest. Local Synthwave, too, here in Minnesota. Tell us a little bit about Denotive. So Denotive has been around for uh, a little while. You could call it a trio at its most simplest form. It's uh, Matt, Matt, and Carl. The lead. Matt goes by Denotive. He uh, plays multiple synths, talented at that. And then Carl is his live guitarist, and the other Matt is uh, does his electronic drum kit, and uh, he can kick an electronic drum pedal like nobody's business. So you'll enjoy it. You'll be uh, be rocking, rocking to this one. Yes, powerful. We're excited about that. Now I enjoyed a beverage, a beer. The dra- <laughs> it's a funny name. Dragu Vape Puff Tart. Did you kettle enjoy sour. that? Did you really did. enjoy that? Very whimsical drink. Yeah. It's a kettle sour. Hard to find on the internet. Yes, I don't have the stats on it, but it was definitely low alcohol. If you had to guess an IBU, what would you guess? Zero. <laughs> You're such a man when it comes to beer. Yes. So basically what it was was a fruit smoothie. With alcohol. A very little alcohol. Yes. Right? You didn't even catch a buzz off of it? Maybe, but I doubt it. It's really low alcohol. <laughs> if, if you can't remember. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and, and we can't even find, we can find the brewery online, but we can't find any information on the beer online. So it's a discontinued flavor, so I hope what you had wasn't stale or out of date. No, it was very good. It was dragon fruit, basically was the gist of it. Milk, sugar. The the what of it? The gist. Okay. Yes. Milk, sugar, dragon fruit, pineapple, I believe. It was really good. Yeah. Really thick. I mean, it was literally like something you would make in your blender. (laughs) Do You you needed a spoon and a straw, I'm taking. Yes. Uh, And if people want to see the picture at Amish Bee Machine on Twitter. Amish Bee Machine. Make sure you follow us at Amish Bee Machine on Twitter. I got pictures there. Also, Instagram. Follow us on Instagram. How much baby machine? Yeah. Oh, it was really good. It looked really thick. It really did. How was the head? Zero. Zero head? Yeah. It was just basically a fruit smoothie. And it, the color was really cool. It was this really bright pinkish red. Almost unreal. It was surreal. Yeah. It, wow. 
Yeah, it was bright. It definitely was bright. Now, sometimes you add a filter to your beer pictures. Was there a filter involved with this? Was it really that pink? I will not talk about my filter use. Okay, good. Fair enough. So how did it drink? I mean, did it feel like a milkshake going down or how did it compare to some of your other sours that you've reviewed? Well, it didn't bring all the boys to the yard. It was good. It was very thick. Like I said, it literally tastes like a fruit smoothie. If you ever blend up smoothies. Yeah. That's the closest I can think of. It was very good. I enjoyed it. It had a lot of uh, stuff going on, a lot of flavor. Yeah. Thumbs up. Was it an amusement park on in your mouth? I don't know. Valley Fair for a local reference. Sure. Very good. Thumbs up. I enjoyed it. I am giving it 4.5 Whoa. passion fruits. You've never given a passion fruit rating that high before for a beer. It's really tickled your, your fancy, huh? Yes. I don't know what that means, but it was very good. Wow. Interesting. Well, we're going to have to try to find it somewhere. Like I said, you can't find it online. The websites, all the multiple websites that we used to try to find stats on beer didn't have anything on it. It's out of the great state of Wisconsin Brewing Project. They also had another, they also have other uh, Puff Tart versions. Yep. And I reviewed that and that was also good. Okay. Yeah, they, uh, it seems like one of those fancy schmancy breweries. I mean, there's beer nerdery and then there's beer nerdery. And I think that brewery has definitely got like different weird, they like to add a lot of fruit to their beers. Yes, this was a kettle sour, and I it there's nothing about it that tasted like a beer to me. <laughs> it was just good. That's definitely right up your alley, then, because yes. you're not a beer drinker. No. But you'd like to drink a lot of beer that tastes like fruit juices. Yes. I enjoyed it. It was good. Definitely not an IPA. Yeah. Thumbs up. Awesome. On the puff tart. Oh, all right. Well, and on the next episode, we will get back to the manly beers and i will review an ipa well that's the thing i have so much testosterone i'm so manly <laughs> that i can handle these i don't i don't need it secure in your yes, beer masculinity very powerful. speaking nice. of that the gyms are opening up next week here in the great state of minnesota i'm excited to hit the weights hang and bang flash and burn i don't know i don't I know don't, any weightlifting yes terms. we'll get you in the gym yeah i don't know i don't do you, i don't know do, can do you think i can get some roids or something i'm gonna roids yeah at a rage. Yes. You did have a power. We gave you a powerful five hour energy right before yeah. we fired up the mics. Do you feel it? Did it I, kick in? It, it's kicked in. Actually, um, it's, I can feel it. Uh, you know, I always joke about it coursing through my veins. This one is coursing through the veins as we speak. I can feel it. Good. It was a uh, grape. Did you enjoy the grape flavor? I did. It tasted like grape. Uh, I think I commented that it tastes like uh, Dimatap cough syrup, the grape flavor. Yes. It's not a bad flavor. No, it's a wonderful flavor. Grape is a powerful flavor. I enjoy it. Yeah. Grape, purple. I mean, it's all the same to me. You have a purple shirt on, so that's good. I have a purple shirt on. It's got some paint on it, but you know. Now, do they have grape kettle sours? Because if they do, or would that just be wine? I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think what you're talking about is wine. <laughs> powerful. Powerful show today. We have the Diet Love Pass. Mystery, the incident we're going to talk about. Yeah. Let's uh, get into song of the day. So what I did is I picked a powerful song. A theme going on here. Yes. So I picked a song from the powerful Cold War Sting. We all know him, the wrestler turned rock star. Mm -hmm. Lead singer, lead bassist of the band The Police. Yes, Russians, the name of this song. Russians is a uh, song from his debut solo album, The Dream of the Blue Turtles. Yes, I often have dreams of blue, blue turtles. That's uh, a very, very whimsical name. Uh, the album itself was released in June 1985. Uh, the song was released as a sing single in November, and uh, the song is a commentary and plea that uh, criticizes the then. Uh, dominant Cold War foreign policy. So just like you said, it's a, it's a very, like a time capsule in a song, I guess you could say. Haunting. Very haunting. 
the uh if you look up the lyrics it's uh you can definitely tell it's uh, about uh russian children president reagan and nuclear war gorbachev yeah the in 2010 sting explained that the the song was inspired by watching soviet tv which uh he was able to get a hold of because he had a a friend who was an inventor who invented a satellite receiver at Columbia University that uh, pretty much just like stole uh, Russian television signals. Sweet. Yeah, so Tapped they, into the CCCP. Yeah, so they would go in upstairs to uh, the roof of his friend's apartment building, drink some beer, and watch television. They said the, uh, the program they got the most was the Russian version of Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to know what kind of characters. <laughs> Ah, comrade, do you know how to get to Sesame Street? <laughs> comrade Bart, Bart, whatever his name is. <laughs> Big, Tell him, stop eating. Big Bart. Do you think it was a, just a total blatant ripoff? Oh, yeah. Like, do you remember the Russian space shuttle? Yep. <laughs> they had a Russian space shuttle. It was literally exact carbon copy of the, our space shuttle. I wonder how they got that information. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, uh, it actually made it pretty big here in uh, the United States as far as uh, singles go. It made it to number 16 on our Hot 100. In France, though, it had the biggest uh, chart top. It went to number two. Whoa, was it big in Japan? Uh, doesn't say anything about Japan here. It actually went gold in France, selling 500,000 copies. Yeah, it was a haunting song. Powerful. Very powerful. In uh, Flanders, Belgium, it reached number seven. Whoa. Diddly diddly. Yes. Powerful. Yeah. The Flanders. Yeah, so go check it out. That is Russians by Sting on his solo album, The Dream of the Blue Turtles. Before we get into this powerful mystery, let's do a cheers. Let's um, toast our friends that are listening. Make sure you hold up beverage of whatever you're drinking. Cheers, my friends. Cheers. Now, wherever you are listening, please do us a favor. Leave a review. If you're on Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, Apple, wherever you listen, please leave a five-star review. Five-star review is the highest. Rate it five, and then you will unlock the secrets to this powerful mystery we're going to talk about. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Amish Bean. Follow us on Instagram, Amish Baby Machine. Check out our YouTube channel. And if you want to help support this podcast, go to Patreon, patreon.com. We also have links on AmishBabyMachine.com. And also shop our merch. We have powerful merch, t-shirts, hoodies, stickers, mugs, whatever you need, we got it. Powerful links on AmishBabyMachine.com. I'm Mike Rez. Let's get into the mystery known as the Dietlov Past. We're going to be reading here from uh, Wikipedia about... This incident, uh, pretty spooky and mysterious. I don't know where you came up with this one. Never heard of it until you mentioned it. This was actually a a pretty, makes that research a little bit more fun for me because I have no idea going into it. Powerful. All right, the Dietlov Pass incident was an event in which nine Russian hikers died in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd in 1959. In uncertain circumstances, the experienced trekking group, who were all from the Ural Ural Polytechnical Institute, had established a camp on the slopes of the Kolat Cycle in the area known, now named uh, in honor of the group's leader, Igor Dietlov. During the night, something caused them to tear their way out of their tents and flee the campsite while inadequately dressed with a heavy snowfall and sub-zero temperatures. After the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined the six, that six of them had died of hypothermia, while the other three showed signs of physical trauma. One victim had a fractured skull, two others had major chest fractures, and the body of one of the group was missing both eyes. One of the victims was missing a tongue. The investigation concluded that a compelling force of nature had caused the deaths. Numerous theories have been put forward to the account for the unexplained deaths, including animal attacks, hypothermia, avalanche, catabatic winds, infrasound-induced panic, 
military involvement, some combination of all of these. We have yetis, we have fireballs, aliens. Some background on this group, in 1959, the group was formed for a skiing expedition across the northern Urals. Igor Dietlov, a 23-year-old radio engineering student at the Ural Polytechnical Institute, now known as the Ural Federal University, uh, he was the leader who assembled the group of nine others for the trip, most of whom were fellow students and peers at the university. Each member of the group, which consisted of eight men and two women, was an experienced grade two hiker with ski tour experience, and they would all be receiving their grade three certification upon their return. At that time, that was the highest certification available in the Soviet Union and required candidates to traverse 190 miles. The goal of the expedition was to reach the Gora Ortrin, which was a mountain 6.2 miles north of the site of the incident. Uh, this route in February was an estimated Category 3, the most difficult category. The members of the expedition were, were uh, Igor Dietlov, he was 23 years old, uh, Yuri Doroshenko, Luidema Dubanina, Yuri Kurvanashenko, Alexander Polotov, uh, Zaninda Komagorva, Rustim Slobodan, Nikolai uh, Thibodeau uh, Brignolis, Alexander uh, Zolotarov, and Yuri Yudin. Yuri Yudin now was somebody who left the expedition early because of injury dags, but he was not involved in the death of the other nine. He was, uh, he'll play a, a kind of an intricate role later. They'll bring him up and why uh, he was important, but he did have some kind of uh, arthritis or back pain or injury or something going on. So the group arrived uh, by train uh, in a town at the center of the northern providence of the uh, Sverdalux Oblast in the early morning hours of January 25th. They then took a truck to another town, a little village, that was the uh, last inhabited uh, settlement of the north while spending the night in uh, Viza. Skiers purchased and ate loaves of bread to keep their level ener energy levels up for the following day's hike. Uh, on January 27th, they began their trek toward Gora Orden. On January 28th, one of the members, Yuri Yudin, who suffered from several health ailments, turned back due to knee and joint pain that made him unable to continue the trek. The remaining group of the nine continued on the trek. Now, diaries and cameras found around their last campsite made it possible to track the group's route up to the day preceding the incident. On January 31st, the group arrived at the edge of the highland area and began uh, to prepare for climbing. In a wooded valley, they cached surplus food and equipment that would be used for their trip back. The following day, February 1st, the hikers started to move through the pass. It seems they planned to get over the pass and make camp for the next night on the opposite side, but because of worsening weather conditions, snowstorms and the like, and decreasing visibility, they lost their direction and deviated west up towards the top of the mountain. When they realized their mistake, the group decided to stop and set up camp there on the slope of the mountain uh, rather than move the 0.93 miles downhill to a forested area that would have offered some shelter for the bad weather. Uh, Yudin uh, postulated that Dietlov probably did not want to lose the altitude they had gained or he decided to practice camping on the mountain slope. So Yudin goes back and uh, he was told by uh, Dietlov to wait for a telegram when they got done in the village them going north in the mountain. So that's uh, what the, he's waiting for when he went back. He's actually waiting at the next village, waiting for this telegram. Worsening conditions and bad visibility uh, made them set up camp for the night, which is going to turn out not to be very good for this group. Before the search and, So for the search and discovery, before leaving, Dietlov had agreed he would send a telegram to their sports club as soon as the group returned to Vizai. It was expected that this would happen no later than February 12th. But Ditloff had told Yudin before his departure from the group that he expected it to be a little longer. When the 12th passed and no messages had been received, there was no immediate reaction as delays of a few days were common with such expeditions. On February 20th, the relatives of the travelers demanded a rescue operation 
and the head of the institute sent the first rescue groups consisting of volunteers and students and teachers. Later, the army and military forces became involved with planes and helicopters being ordered to join the rescue operation. On February 26th, the searchers found the group's abandoned and badly damaged tent. The campsite baffled the search party. The student who found the tent said the tent was half torn down and covered with snow. It was empty. All the group's belongings and shoes had been left behind. Investigators said the tent had been cut open from the inside. Eight or nine sets of footprints left by people who were only wearing socks or a single shoe or even barefoot could be followed leading down towards the edge of the nearby woods on the opposite side of the pass, which was about uh, 0.9 miles to the northeast. However, after 1,600 feet, the tracks were covered in snow. The forest edge, under a large Siberian pine, the searchers found the visible remains of a small fire. There where they found the first two bodies, those of uh, Kurnvinshenko and Doroshenko, the shoeless, shoeless and dressed only in their underwear. The branches of the tree were broken up to five meters high, suggesting that one of the skiers had climbed up to look for something, perhaps the camp. Between the pine and the camp, the searchers found three more corpses, Dietlov, Komagorva, and Slobodin, uh, who seemed to have died in poses suggesting that they were attempting to return to the tent. They were found separately at distances of uh, 980, 1570, and 2070 feet from the tree, so different different distances, meaning some of them got a little further, one got further than the other um, on their way back to the tent, it looked like. Finding the remaining four travelers took more than two months. They were finally found on May 4th under 13 feet of snow in a ravine 246 feet further into the woods uh, from the pine tree. Three of those four were better dressed than the others, and there were signs that those had died first had their clothes relinquished to the others. Uh, Dubanina was wearing Orovashenko's burned, torn trousers, and her left foot and shin were wrapped in a torn jacket. The investigation, a legal inquest, started immediately after the first five bodies were found. Medical examination found no injuries that may have led to their deaths, and it was eventually concluded that they had all died of hypothermia. Slobodan had a small crack in his skull, but it was not thought to be a fatal wound. An examination of the four bodies that were found in May shifted the narrative as to what had in occurred during the incident. Three of the ski hikers had fatal injuries. Thibodeau Brignolis had a skull damage, and both uh, Dubinia and Zolotorov had major chest fractures. The force required to cause such damage would have been extremely high, comparable to the force of a tr car crash. Notably, the bodies had no external wounds associated with the bone fractures, as they had been subject to a high level of pressure. All four bodies found at the bottom of the creek in a running stream of water had soft tissue damage uh, to their head and face. For example, uh, Dubinina was missing her tongue, eyes, and part of the, her lips, as well as facial tissue and a fragment of skull bone, while another had his eyeballs missing, and uh, Alexander Polovotov had his eyebrows missing. There was initial speculation uh, that the Manzi people, who were indigenous in the area, reindeer herders, uh, had attacked and murdered the group uh, for encroaching upon their land. Several Manzi were inter interrogated, but the investigation indi indicated that the nature of their deaths did not support this hypothesis. Only the hikers' footprints were visible, and they showed no sign of hand-to-hand -hand struggle. Although the temperature was very low, around uh, 15 to 22 below Fahrenheit, with the storm blowing, the dead were only partially dressed. Some of them had only one shoe, while others had shoes or wore only socks. Some were found wrapped in snips of ripped clothing that seemed to have been cut from those already dead. So to recap, nine students were camping. They pitched a tent during the storm, and sometime during the night, something spooked them, scared them so much that they clawed their way, cut their way through the tent and took off. Correct. And some of these were not wearing any amount of clothes that would needed to be in that cold of a climate. Right, yeah, which adds to the mystery of what in the hell happened. So we got to know what would happen. 
Now there's a bunch of different theories. Some are crazy, some make sense. Yeah, it's kind of amazing how many different theories there are that multiple ones could could explain what happened. But why don't you go through the list of some of them and then we'll go through some of what what the re or what some of the investigators think could have happened. Well, there's been any talk, there's been talk about the Yeti, that this was an actual Yeti attack. But there is footprints of the campers, of the hikers. Mm -hmm. So there would have been Yeti footprints, I would assume, in the snow. Yeah, unless he put on some of their shoes. Would not fit because he is a Bigfoot. Correct. An Alpine Bigfoot. Now, the injuries... The deaths were hypothermia, but some were actually, the deaths were caused by trauma to the body. Right, yeah, we have uh, quite a few of them. The list is hypothermia uh, as far as cause of death. One of them, uh, one of the female skiers, uh, her cause of death is listed as internal bleeding from severe chest trauma. She's also the one that had her tongue missing and her eyeballs. So they had massive internal injuries with a powerful force that would have to be the amount of g-force in a car accident right now that would not happen let's say for example yeti would attack if the yeti attacked there would be damage on the skin but there these bodies there was no damage on the outside of the skin no 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 uh no external injuries whatsoever except for uh like the skull fracture one of them had a piece of skull missing, but that could have been from decomposition of the skin, you know, from the skull fracture. What we have here is someone being attacked by a force of nature. Mm -hmm. So the Yeti attack, my powerful opinion, I am not agreeing with that. <laughs> I am not agreeing with Yeti. Either. And then, so right now we're going to talk about paranormal, supernatural. There was reports of strange glowing orange orbs yeah that kind of feeds into the ufo alien talk uh as as part of some of the you know investigators and other explanations there were reports of i guess you could say fireballs orange orbs in the sky in that area uh, multiple people reported them um so that's why some some believe that it could be UFO slash alien related, which sure if they're you know 1959 in Russia, what I mean that would be enough to spook the hell out of you. You don't know what that is. Would that cause you to run out into the cold though? Yeah, something spooked them. They ran out half dressed. And there's also a theory we're going to talk about paradoxal undressing we could get into that right now paradoxal undressing is you're getting hypothermia you're so cold that your body reacts in different ways you would think you would put more clothes on but you remove clothes correct 20 to 50 percent of hypothermia deaths are associated with paradoxical undressing typically occurs during moderate to severe hypothermia as the person becomes disoriented, confused, and combative. They may begin discarding their clothing, which in turn increases the weight or the rate of heat loss. Excuse me. Yes, it's ironic that they should be putting more clothes on. But what is weird is some of these campers, they had more clothes on. They had multiple layers. Right. One of the uh, YouTube videos that I read or that I read, that I watched, uh, said something that maybe as those people were dying, the other hikers were taking their clothes to keep warm themselves because not many of them left with much on. So as hikers are dying, the surviving hikers are stealing clothes. But if the surviving hikers are so freaked out by the hypothermia, wouldn't they mentally wouldn't have the capacity to think that way? If hypothermia hits everybody at the same time. Like you and I could be out in the cold, but maybe your hypothermia doesn't start for another couple minutes after mine kicks in. So I'm already ahead of schedule with my rate of hypothermia, you know what I mean? Yes, but it's very cold right. and the wind chill would be incredible. Correct. So I think it would hit everyone pretty damn quickly. 
I just don't want you to start taking my clothes off if we're ever no, in that situation. No, no we're not even going to... Thought didn't even cross my powerful mind. So as far as the fireballs, there is, there was Soviet activity bombing in that area where they were dropping parachute bombs. For the military test, there's speculation that exists that the campsite fell within the path of Soviet parachute mine exercise. This theory alleges that the hikers, awoken by loud explosions, fled the tent in a shoeless panic that found themselves unable to return for supply retrieval. After some members froze to death attempting to endure the bombardment, others commandeered their clothing only to be fatally injured by subsequent parachute mine concussions. There are indeed records of parachute mines being tested by the Soviet military in the area. Around the time the hikers were there, parachute mines detonate while still in the air rather than upon striking the Earth's surface to produce signature injuries similar to those experienced by the hikers. Heavy internal damage with comparable less external trauma. Yes, and the shockwave would, would form a, a globe, an orb. Correct. Because it's being air bursted versus if something hits the ground and digs a crater, kicks up a fireball. Correct. Mushroom yep. cloud. Yep. And this theory uh, coincides with reported sightings of glowing orange orbs floating in the air. Of course, the military is not going to come out and say anything. So that's what led to speculation of UFOs as well for the common folk that were watching. And there was also reports of wreckage on the ground. Yes, there was. I guess shrapnel of some kind, you could say. As far as, because, you know, mines aren't going to just blow up and disintegrate. They're going to leave some kind of evidence behind. So another theory is an avalanche. Yes, the avalanche, which was the the original explanation, uh, which is uh, what a lot of investigators would say would cause more of the car crash type injuries that some of the bodies had. But why wouldn't they all have the injuries? And if there was an avalanche, avalanches are massive and it would have buried everything. There were some people buried in 13 feet of snow and some people not. There was footprints all over. You would assume an avalanche would bury all the footprints. There was there was a fire they found, like they built a fire to keep warm. In one of the, uh, the YouTube videos uh, by a person that goes by Lamino on his channel, uh, what his theory was about the avalanche was that maybe the f- first five bodies that were found maybe there wasn't an avalanche to begin with something spooked them to get them out of the tent Um, but the four that were found buried were probably searching for something looking for something maybe got disoriented lost their way back to the tent Um, and then a where the the area they were in maybe an avalanche occurred or a ravine snow ravine collapsed on them and that was the, the reason why their injuries are different than the other ones, because what they experienced was a fall or maybe getting hit by the power of the avalanche in the area. They were found, they were found further away from the other five bodies, and that maybe they were... Footprints showing they were further away. Right. Correct. Meaning they were running from something scared. There was also people were talking about that they were experienced hikers, climbers, campers, whatever you want to call them, and they wouldn't have pitched a tent near something that would have the the ability of a an avalanche to hit them right in the uh cnn story that we read uh one of his uh uh igor dietlov's friends said that they had camped and hiked in that same area the year before and they knew when you know quote unquote like avalanche season or what areas would cause avalanches and there wasn't anything in that area the year before that sparked any, uh, you know, put up any warning signs or warning flags to them about the danger of avalanches in that area. So, uh, uh, Dietlov's friend is happy that they reopened the case again or the investigation into what happened. Said he doesn't believe that an avalanche was the cause of, of what got them out of the tent place. No, an avalanche, if it would have caused this massive internal injuries, would have also caused surface injuries. Right. Yeah, you would think so. The rocks, debris, the trees, the shrapnel from the alleged parachute bombs right would have shred up their skin too but no they were fine on the outside but then they showed massive internal injuries right and let you know depending on where they find the shrapnel too concussion injuries happen with bombs all the time yes so uh, like you said that's probably to me that's probably more one of the more explainable ones plausible right 
Uh, but you're not going to get the military to admit to that. At least you didn't in 1959. Well, that's the thing with the Soviets. I mean, when they had when they had their submarine disasters, they never say anything about it until it's no. too late. Yeah. And even the even, Kursk, you know, when that happened, right? If they would have, you know, put out the word right away to help rescue the the submariners, so the Soviets have been known to cover up things, and that's why this is interesting. It happened in 1959. And now in 2019, it's 2020 now, they're reopening the case. Right. So they must have had some compelling evidence. Yeah, it sounds like a, a lot of journalists haven't let up in Russia with this one. And it seems to be one of those uh, investigations that a lot of journalists keep bringing up. And finally, um, I don't know, somebody found enough evidence to reopen it to find out exactly what happened. I don't know how much evidence you're going to find 60 years later, but... It's kind of interesting to see what some of the theories are. Well, the good thing is cold weather usually preserves things. Yes. And I'm also, that's not, it's not a main area where people go. No. So it's not going to be disturbed. No. And uh, I want, the flock should go look up the pictures because there's still, there's a lot of black and white photos. There's photos from one of the cameras they found too, so you can see. Found footage. Yes. So describe to our listeners some of the photos they found. Yeah, they were photos of, you know, people on expedition in a party having fun and, you know, going on a ski trip. There's photos of them gathered around, uh, you know, their tent, gathered around fires, uh, hanging out. Uh, there's photos of them, you know, posing with each other. And those are the, the pictures that were found on the hikers and skiers' cameras. They also found a lot of diaries as well. So they have they can kind of piece together what their days were like before and what happened uh, just before the incident that occurred that have, have caused them to run out. There's also pictures on the internet of them actually finding the bodies during the investigation and the search. Uh, so there's lots of photos of uh, frozen bodies in the snow. There's a couple under the tree that they talked about, the Siberian pine. There's actually quite a few photos of the four that were found with their eyes missing. Uh, so you can see pictures of them as well. They have pictures of them in the snow where they found them and then in the, uh, the morgue, I guess you could say. Uh, still still in the, the positions they were found in, which is kind of creepy. So we have a couple uh, other theories. One is a catabatic winds and also infrasound. Yeah, let's start with catabatic wind. Uh, a catabatic wind is a technical name for a uh, drainage wind, a wind that carries high-density air from a higher elevation down a slope under the force of gravity. Uh, such winds are sometimes called fall winds. Catabatic uh, winds can rush down elevated slopes at hurricane speeds, but most are not as intense as that, and many... Um, are 10 knots or less, and that will cause great damage as well. So the catabatic wind theory, in 2009, a Swedish-Russian expedition was made to the site, and after investigations, they proposed that a violent catabatic wind uh, was a likely explanation for the incident. Uh, the catabatic winds are somewhat rare events and can be extremely violent. Uh, they were implicated in a 1978 case in Sweden where eight hikers were killed and one was seriously injured in the aftermath of a catabatic wind. The topography of these locations were noted to be very similar according to this expedition. A sudden catabatic wind would have made it impossible to remain in the tent, and the most rational course of action would be for the hikers to cover the tent with snow and seek shelter among the tree line. There was also a torch left uh, turned on top of the tent, possibly left there intentionally so the hikers could find their way back to the tent once the wind subsided. The expedition proposed that the group of hikers constructed two bivouac, one of which collapsed, leaving four of the hikers buried with the violent injuries observed. Infrasound is another uh, theory, sometimes referred to as low-frequency sound, describes the sound of waves with the frequency below the lower limit of audibility. That's about 20 hertz or so. Uh, hearing becomes gradually less sensitive as frequently as frequency decreases. So for humans to perceive infrasound, uh, the sound pressure must be significantly higher. The ear is the primary organ for sensing infrasound, but at higher intensities it is possible to feel infrasound vibrations in various parts of the body. In this case, the theory in this 
Dietloff Pass incident, the hypothesis by Donnie Eckler in his 2013 book, Dead Mountain, is the wind going around cycle uh, created a vortex streak, which can pr- produce infrasound capable of inducing panic attacks in humans. According to Eicher's theory, the infrasound generated by the wind as it passed over the top of the mountain was responsible for causing physical discomfort and mental distress in the hikers. Now, the claim is that because of their panic, the hikers were driven to leave the tent by whatever means necessary and fled down the slope. By the time they were further down the hill, they would have been out of the infrasound's path and would have regained their composure, but in the darkness would be unable to return to their shelter. The traumatic injuries suffered by three of the victims were the result of their stumbling over the ledge of a ravine in the darkness and landing on the rock at the bottom. I don't believe that because they would have had skin injuries, surface injuries if they fell. Right. I, I agree with that one as well. You don't just fall into a rock and nothing happens to you. You're going to have scratches and cuts. You, and would, have, you would bleed. Yeah. Bruising at a minimum. Yeah. One of the, uh, the other uh, examples or theories, hypothesis, if you will, from uh, Lamino on YouTube, the video I referenced earlier, He has pictures on his video, and I haven't been able to find them, um, but there's a picture supposedly of their one of their tent setups, their camps, where there's like a wood-burning stove chimney or something coming out of the door of the tent, the entrance of the tent. And his hypothesis is that they use the tent or that uh, stove to keep the tent warm and that temperature. So he thinks that maybe they had some kind of fire or smoke incident with the wood-burning stove, which caused them all to leave in a hurry which is why some of them weren't dressed because it was in the middle of the night while they were sleeping and that that caused them to run out into the trees to the tree line and then when they realized you know they started the fire tried to start the small fire when they realized that they had to go back for some supplies um the three other body you know where the three bodies were found they were heading back and then the four that were found further away that were more dressed but had more of the internal injuries somehow triggered an avalanche and fell down a ravine as well. That was his theory. There is a photo that I did find, and uh, I'll post it on my on my Twitter, at Mike Rez Radio, uh, of one of the hikers posing with what looks like to be burnt clothes. He's still wearing, like, like maybe there was a small fire or somehow his clothes got too close to the, to the stove itself or the oven or whatever they were using to warm the tent. So we'll have that up there too take a look at that well something spooked him from the tent something did spook him from the tent you don't leave by cutting a hole in the tent no but what caused the massive internal injuries is what i want to know because infrasound all those i understand that to spook you to get out of the tent but out of nine people would nine people all have the same effect would the infrasound freak out nine different people i don't think so i don't think so either so to me most plausible in my mind is the parachute bombs. They're in there, maybe they're sleeping, they're partying, all of a sudden massive explosions, massive like what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. We gotta get out of here. Go, go, go. They get out there and they're getting killed by the concussion. Some people were killed, some people climbing up the trees, what the hell, we gotta gotta alert someone what's going on and we gotta let them know that stop bombing us, there's people here. Right. So to me, the most plausible is the parachute bombs. Yeah, I'm buying the parachute bomb theory myself. Like you said, if you're going to fall down a ravine, you're going to get hit by an avalanche, you're going to have some kind of kind of external wounds. And to not have that, would, exp- to me, would be like some kind of concussion injury. Massive pressure wave. Right, yeah. Yes. So uh, that, would, that would explain, you know... Four of those deaths hopefully you know now we don't know what the swedish we don't know what what kind of injuries they got from the catabatic winds no it doesn't say anything about the types of injuries that were caused by the winds it's just that it was in 1978 the the conditions were a lot similar to those conditions that they they believe was found so that one to me also seems plausible then yeah. i mean if they're comparing the two and these people actually died I'm going with either fireballs, you know, or the catabatic winds. Yeah. I'm going to lean more towards balls. Yes, powerful. Exploding balls. Yes. Would be uh, devastating. That is a 
weird story. It's a mystery. Obviously, it's a big enough mystery where they reopened the case in 2019. Yeah, and there's lots of movies, documentaries available out there. One of them was on Netflix. It's not available there anymore. There's a movie called The Devil's Pass, and this was uh, made by a, uh, a Russian movie company that follows five American hikers that go and try to follow the footsteps of this expedition, and it's like a found footage type. Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about it. It's just got a movie written all over right. it. Yeah. Young people partying, you know, Sex. whatever. They try to say that they didn't party. Oh, they, they partied. So you think about them, they're all in a tent, the found footage, everything about it makes a great movie. Right, yeah. And it's Russia, so there's vodka involved. Yeah, powerful. Great story. Interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let's, uh, before we wrap up this powerful episode, let's get some shout outs in. We have the Indie Drop In Podcast Network, He Said, She Said Movie Reviews, Unpaid Programming Podcast, Asi Ritala. We have JD's World Podcast, The Hub Podcast, and Rook and Titus. Thanks for listening. We hope you had a good time. Did you have a good time tonight, Mike? I had a great time. I hope the flock learned a little something about some mysteries. Stick around for Streets of Passion. Yes. We just ask you one thing. Please tell a friend about our powerful podcast. And until next time, you've just enjoyed the Amish Baby Machine Pop Culture Podcast.
Thank you for listening to the Amish Baby Machine Pop Culture Podcast. It is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and everywhere else fine podcasts are found. Please support our podcast through Patreon and shop our merch at AmishBabyMachine.com. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. This has been an Amish Baby Machine production. 